Hi everyone and welcome to our talk on our recent paper Counter-Strike Deathmatch with Large-Scale Behavioural Cloning. This work is by myself, Tim Pierce, and my supervisor, Zhu Jun, uh, which I did during a postdoc at Tsinghua University. So this project really started uh, very outcome focused. Uh, so we thought a really interesting, difficult challenge uh, would be to build an AI agent for the video game Counter-Strike. Um, I think what made it really tricky and interesting was the constraints that we had. So we were an academic lab, so our compute was quite limited. Um, working on a modern game, we also couldn't uh, simulate this much quicker than real time, and we didn't have the compute to parallelize it. Uh, we also didn't have any relationship with the game developer, so even interfacing with the game was quite challenging. It's quite interesting to contrast this with a lot of success stories in AI for video game playing. So typically these are framed as kind of control problems where you want to maximize the score. Um, and the typical, ingredient, typical ingredients we see are a lot of compute and then either working on older games that can be simulated much quicker than real time uh, or for the more modern games, these tend to be parallelized um, across a lot of different systems. Um, and these also often have a nice wrapper where you can run these games in a sort of open AI gym type environment. Uh, more recently, uh, there's also uh, uh, the, the efforts have tried to distance themselves from pixels where possible. Um, and a lot of these efforts have been uh, with very large teams. If you have those ingredients, then taking a, a kind of simple RL algorithm and scaling it up um, has been shown to, to be really effective at this. As I said in the first slide, you know, what was interesting about, about our paper is perhaps we didn't have um, any of these ingredients, um, which meant that we couldn't use this, this kind of typical uh, recipe that we've seen work well before. And actually, even the objective we felt didn't really fit, didn't really fit Counter-Strike. Um, so for, for a long time in Counter-Strike, there's been a, a kind of hacking problem uh, where actually with some very simple rules-based behavior, uh, you know, you can get perfect aim, uh, which kind of maximizes the score, uh, but is completely boring to play with. Um, and so we weren't really interested in, in emulating this type of behavior. Uh, we're much more interested in building something that played the game in a more human-like way. And so in some ways, I, I feel like we stumbled across what turned out to be um, a really interesting research question, both from an academic point of view and also from an industry point of view, which is, how can we build strong human-like agents for modern video games on a compute budget? In this talk, I'm going to be covering the sort of general behavioral cloning methodology we used, which we believe can be applied to, to different modern games. And then also talking about some of the more specific design decisions we, we made um, that, that perhaps relate more to FPS games. So Counter-Strike itself is, is a hugely popular title. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Um, the latest iteration is about 10 years old, uh, but it continues to receive updates. Um, at any moment, you might have around 1 million players uh, playing this game. Um, and there's also a big esports scene built around it. So even for people who don't actively play it, uh, they, you know, they might enjoy watching this. Um, I'm going to play a short clip of a human playing the deathmatch game mode. So this is the game mode that the paper focused on. Uh, you have two teams, terrorists and counter-terrorists, and the objective is to run around the map, uh, detect the members of the opposite team, and uh, shoot them before they shoot you. Um, the mouse control is a real key element of Counter-Strike, so this is... Um, this controls the firing and looking around, and, and you have to be really precise um, and, and, and very kind of high skilled at this. Um, and as well as the mouse, you then have the keyboard that kind of moves moves the player around the map. Uh, and we focused on this classic Dust 2 uh, map. Now, since we didn't have the compute to do kind of pure RL uh, methods, um, and we were also interested in this human-like requirement, uh, this really led us to, to think about using behavioral cloning. So with behavioral cloning, um, you collect a data set for, from an expert or some policy that you want to imitate um, that has both observations and actions. So 
For us, the observations were screenshots of the game and the actions were both the mouse movements, the mouse clicks and the uh, keyboard presses. Once you have a data set, you can then minimize some kind of a loss function to train a model to output the actions that the expert would have taken. The challenge then becomes, you know, where, where does this demonstration data set come from? Um, so we're certainly not the first people to consider behavioral cloning for video games. Uh, there's a lot of great work uh, out there already, some of which we've listed on the slide. When we were digging into the literature, something we found quite interesting was there were two very different scales uh, of behavioral cloning efforts. Um, there was kind of the, the smaller data sets that were typically created by researchers recording data themselves. And these led to agents that were maybe on, on the weaker side. Um, but there were also a couple of examples um, of much bigger data sets, uh, which led to, led to agents of, of kind of stronger performance. And so the, the question we had was, was, you know, how, how can we collect like a large scale data set? Uh, the approach we took was to join Counter-Strike games in what's called spectator mode. So you're not actively playing the game in this mode, but you're just watching other people play. And by doing that, we can then scrape screenshots of, of what the player is seeing. And we also scrape metadata, uh, for example, X, Y, Z coordinates of the player. Unfortunately, we don't have access to the kind of ground truth action actions that the player is uh, applying. So we then had to build an inverse dynamics model, which we did through, through a kind of rule rules based algorithm to infer what actions were being taken. I'm going to play, play a short clip of, of some of the data that we collected. It, it, you know, there was quite a lot of engineering effort to um, build this script, but the great thing is that like, once you've done it, you can just leave it running for, for you know, however long you want. And you get this really nice variety of data where you get a lot of diversity in, in you know, equipment and play styles, and it really kind of covers the, the whole map. Um, as well as that, we also uh, did create one of these smaller kind of curated data sets. And one of the really nice things about this is you do have direct access to these clean actions, uh, which we didn't have for the, for the larger pre-training data set. Um, another nice thing is you can really focus on a single play style. So you can use one equipment loadout, one team, um, and one style of play. And combining these two data sets, we'll see later, uh, is what really le led to, to good performance for us. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the agent design. Um, so there were a lot of decisions we, we had to face around, for example, what do we do with the pixel space? How much do we crop it? Um, how, how much do we crush it down? Um, and we've uh, shown that the final decision that we came up with uh, on the slide. The action space was really challenging, particularly with, with the mouse space. So I talked about um, how with Counter-Strike, it's very important to have this very precise mouse movement. Uh, we found that discretizing the, the mouse X and the mouse Y gave better performance than treating it um, as a continuous variable. Um, and actually, the way we did the discretization was not doing the, the sort of uniform uh, bins, but actually providing more options around the crosshair where you're more likely to need to do these kind of fine adjustments um, and having less options um, like further out. In terms of architecture, we used an efficient net B0, which gives a nice trade-off between speed and accuracy. Um, we kind of deleted the last few pooling layers. Um, so, so this net, this neural network was, uh, you know, originally made for image classification, where you just need to know whether something was in the image. For us, actually, we care about where it is in the image, so we didn't want to lose too much spatial information. Um, and then we also have this convolutional LSTM layer uh, to allow the agent to to kind of estimate both its own movement and the movement of others. Uh, and then we've listed the the action space that, that we ended up using as well there. To evaluate the agent, uh, we did a few different things. Um, so perhaps the simplest thing you can do is, is, is just allow the agent to, to you know, roll out in, in a server. And we defined a few different uh, difficulty levels uh, for this. We measured the kills per minute and the kill to death ratio. 
we compared that to humans of, of different gaming experience, and we were able to draw this conclusion that our agent plays the game to a, to a level that's similar to a casual human gamer. Uh, equivalently, this is also kind of the built-in bot on, on medium difficulty setting. So one of the ablations we did really highlights the, the benefit of using the different data sets that we trained on. So we found that um, by using the large data set only, uh, you could get around 1.8 kills per minute in this ablation study. Um, but by using the manual data set only, you maybe get around 1.2 kills per minute. But actually taking that pre-trained model um, uh, that, that was pre-trained on the large data set and then fine-tuning it on, on the smaller manual data set um, re is really what gave us the best performance. And we think that this gives you a really nice trade-off where you've where the network has seen a, a big diversity of data and, and kind of all different regions of the map, but then it really can kind of focus in on a single kind of expert high-quality policy. I wanted to highlight a couple of um, more qualitative assessments of, of, the, of the agent's performance. Uh, so in this clip, the agent sort of gets surprised by a, by a player uh, that's kind of hiding behind a door. Um, and the nice thing is, you know, you, you don't get this superhuman perfect aim where it you know, might snap to the head of the, of the enemy. Um, and you can almost feel like there's a bit of surprise or, or something that you might expect to see in human play where it sort of presses the trigger slightly earlier before getting the kill. Um, another behavior that we are really happy to see emerge was what, what we call um, holding angles in Counter-Strike. So this is where your aim kind of focuses on the most likely position for an enemy to appear from. Um, so here that there's kind of a, a ledge that you often get an enemy appearing from. So even though, uh, you know, you're moving in a slightly di different direction. You're, you're kind of anticipating that, that someone might appear from, from there. More quantitatively, uh, we also collected heat maps um, of the agent um, and compared that to the, the human data set heat maps that we trained on. And we found that, you know, the agent that was trained on the large data set would sort of map the, would mirror the, the, the heat map from the human large, large data set. Um, but following the fine tuning, um, actually the agent really would learn to kind of follow the same routes and, and visit the same areas um, that we saw in that smaller curated fine tuning data set. I certainly don't want to don't don't want to make it sound like the agent um, is is perfect and we've solved this problem uh, completely. Uh, so I've put a couple of examples here. Um, where there's definitely room for improvement and room for further research. So I think sometimes the agent can be a little uncoordinated between its actions. Um, there's some peculiar scenery that it, that it seems to get very attracted to. Um, and there's also one area of the map where it, where it tends to kind of get a bit disorientated. It's, it's not a very uh, commonly visited area uh, by humans. Um, so I think these, these are all root areas for, for kind of further research and improvement. So to summarize, we've made some progress towards this question of how can we build strong human-like agents for modern games on a compute budget. Uh, we followed this behavioral cloning methodology and we found this combination of pre-training on a larger noisy data set and then fine tuning on a small curated data set works really well. I also discussed some of the um, design decisions we made around the agent in terms of the action and observation space. More generally, I hope that this work puts CSGO on the map as, as a really interesting environment to explore uh, research-wise, and I hope that the community does some things with the large gameplay data set that we collected. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions at the poster session.